Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Lilium Clavijo, um, and thank you for attending today's Women in Leadership Forum, hosted by the Bob Graham Center for Public Service and the Graham Center Student Fellows. Um, like I said, my name is Lilium. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the president of the fellows and your host for the evening. Um, I'm actually a fourth year political science major with minors in sociology and public leadership. And this is one of the events that inspired me to become involved with the fellows three years ago. So this is very full circle for me. Uh, thank you so much to the Bob Graham Center for making this event possible and for providing programs like this that feature public service professionals and leaders in their fields. Thank you to our speakers for taking the time out of their schedules to attend tonight's event. And before we start, we wanted to make some quick announcements. Please make sure if you're not a panelist to keep your camera off until the audience question and answer session because it helps facilitate a better recording for us. And please remember to keep yourself muted at all times. And if you wanna ask a question, just make sure to use the chat feature. They're gonna be monitored by Madison and Sophia. So we will definitely make sure that all of your questions are at least addressed or in the chat. And we are recording the session and it's gonna be shared on the Graham Center's website after the event. Now, it's my pleasure to present Gwen Graham, who's gonna provide the opening remarks today. Gwen served in the US House of Representatives on behalf of Florida's second congressional district from 2015 to 2017. Following in her father's footsteps, former US Senator and Governor Bob Graham, Gwen ran for Congress in 2014. And in 2018, Gwen was a candidate for the gubernatorial election. We're so lucky to have her with us this evening. Ms. Graham. Let me unmute. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for that introduction. On behalf of the Bob Graham Center and the Graham family, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Women in Leadership Forum. This past year has been tough, <laughs> understatement, but despite the challenges, we have discovered new opportunities. In this world of Zoom, Teams, Skype, Go to meetings, and I'm sure I'm missing some. Connections have been created and maintained. Friendships have grown. We have all learned a lot that will continue to benefit us when life returns to normal. What you have learned in this pandemic will strengthen leadership roles in the future. This is Women's History Month. While we usually think of history as the story of the past, it is also a roadmap for the future. This forum will be history when it is over. But what you learn from the presenters and from each other will help guide your future. I hope you use this time to listen, learn, and build relationships that will serve you throughout your life. Women supporting and helping other women to achieve their dreams and fulfill their passions is essential for leadership in the years ahead. I've seen firsthand the difference that women can make in any arena. The women members of Congress were more able than the men to put aside differences and really communicate with each other. I have seen that over and over again throughout my professional career. And I am confident you will see that as well. We need each other for inspiration, support and leadership development. The saying, the sky is the limit, truly applies to women today. The reality of a line from Helen Reddy's 70s era song, I am woman, I hope some on this call remember that song and I'm not gonna sing, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's truer today than ever. I am woman, hear me roar in numbers too great to ignore. So go out and roar, lead, live your dreams. Florida needs you. America needs you. I hope everyone enjoys this forum. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, next, we have Joan Forrest, who's a member of the Graham Center Advisory Council and a graduate of UF. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event, Ms. Forrest. Uh, thank you, Lilium. And uh, first, I'd like to just recognize the four women who have been responsible for putting this program together this year. Lilium, uh, Madison, Sophia, and Anna. Anna joining us from her family's home in Brazil until she gets back to Gainesville. And this is so important to me because the leadership opportunities that I had as an undergrad at the University of Florida in the last century, um, I graduated in 1977, have played a critical role in every aspect of my career. I retired just this past January as the president and CEO of the Dawson Academy. Uh, which is a postgraduate continuing education institute for dentists. I'm not a dentist. I had nothing to do with dentistry, but everything you do, even if you become a veterinarian, has to do with people. And learning to lead people and work with people in teams and in groups will serve you so well. So I love this opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully next year when we can gather in person again and uh, just see the wonderful, terrific women that are coming up to the University of Florida. I also wanna mention that when I was there last year, uh, no, the year before, the last time we were able to meet in person, there were some young men in the audience. And so I hope that, uh, I think I can tell from some of the names, I don't wanna assume anything, that there are some young men with us also. And I want to thank you all for participating and um, it'll be very helpful for you uh, as well, because leadership is leadership. So Liam, Lilium, thank you so much and congratulations on a great uh, event and all the work that you and your fellow uh, have worked on to, to bring this program together. Thank you so much, Ms. Forrest. We're so grateful to have your support. Um, so now I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. We have an amazing, amazing roster. Um, first, we have Alexia Butler. She is a career foreign service officer and a diplomat in residence at Morehouse College with the United States Agency for International Development, commonly known as USAID. Um, she has an extensive history of international work and has worked with women's political initiatives in Uganda. We're so excited to have you. Um, next, we have Gina Duncan. She's the current director of Transgender Equality for Equality Florida. She's recognized as a national and international spokesperson and educator on transgender rights, public policy, and civic engagement. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and then we have the honorary Miriam Irizarry. She's a retired Florida Circuit Court judge and Pinellas County's first Hispanic judge. She served as chief deputy and general counsel to the Pinell Pinellas Clerk of the Circuit Court since 2003, and she was a former president of the Clearwater Bar Association. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. And finally, we have Marion uh, Limaker. She's a re retired cardiology specialist and senior associate dean for faculty affairs and professional development for the College of Medicine at the University of Florida. She's nationally known for her work to prevent cardiovascular disease, particularly in women and the elderly. As you can see, we are so lucky to hear from these amazing women. So we can get started with the question and answering section. Um, so up first, I wanted to ask the group, what is your leadership style? And um, Ms. Duncan, can you start us off? I would love to, and thank you once again for allowing me to be part of this discussion. I am a proud out transgender women. And as such, I have enjoyed serving in leadership roles, actually, um, while presenting in different genders. I've learned and known the experience of leading as a man and leading as a woman. And it's been a very interesting journey looking at how those perspectives really differ and how much they're the same. I have enjoyed positions of being class president from junior high all the way through high school, vice president at East Carolina University, president of the Mortgage Bankers Association, regional manager at Wells Fargo, overseeing a third of the state of Florida, and now leading a program at Equality Florida that spans the state. I believe in, in servant leadership in that if you're able to lift up those around you to excel and exceed and achieve, then all bo you know, boats, all boats rise the tide, 
kind of philosophy is certainly something I believe in, and I've seen it to be true. As regional manager at Wells Fargo, I had a vast array of loan officers across the country and across the state who their success was my success. And now serving in my role of an advocate, an educator at Equality Florida, lifting up other voices to advocate for social justice and equality is something that is paramount in the work that I do now. Thank you, Ms. Sunken. If anybody else would like to chime in. All right, well, I'll, I'll chime in, although I must say, <laughs> Gina Duncan, you've said it all. That is a fantastic um, way to look at leadership, is uh, really um, shining the light on those around you and helping uh, to develop them um, rather than shining the light on yourself. And so for me, uh, leadership didn't come easy. You know, I uh, just a quick story about my background. I was born in, in the mountains of Puerto Rico, single mom, seven of us. And uh, we grew up very poor, small little shack. And from there, we moved to New York City, tenement slums of New York City, our building burned down. And I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would become a lawyer or a judge someday. But my mom, my strong Puerto Rican mom, you know, she was my cheerleader, my mentor, and uh, she believed in me and in each of my brothers and sisters. And so um, I came into that dream, a very shy little girl. And then uh, when I uh, finally emerged, <laughs> graduated from Rutgers College in New Jersey and Rutgers Newark School of Law, is when I really started to. Uh, develop uh, my sense of awareness, my sense of confidence, um, to know that perhaps I, I, someday I could lead. And so eventually, of course, that came to pass. Uh, and uh, so I've uh, enjoyed leadership positions, uh, leading uh, 600 employees of the Pinellas County Clerk's Office. And then I became the president of the Clearwater Bar Association, which is an association of about a thousand lawyers. And then of course, in my capacity as a judge, um, uh, leading in that courtroom because you are the person that everybody looks to. And so uh, the, the, I guess my point in all of that is that, um, you know, it doesn't start out like a natural thing and you gotta build into it. And you have to build up that self-confidence to eventually come into those roles. But, um, um, but you will uh, as, as you progress in your education and in your career. Thank you. I am so inspired by you all. Um, and then if we could just hear from um, Dr. Lee McGrath. Yes, uh, I apologize for the lack of video. My computer decided to act up despite having been on Zoom all week. I don't know what the issue is. So you don't get to see me, which may or may not be good. Uh, um, I, I am likewise inspired by the two leaders we've just heard from. Um, I would say my path was one of dedication and perseverance and an awakening to leadership roles, taking advantage of opportunities as they arose. I, I think... Um, my path has, has been to be present, to be observant, to take advantage of opportunities as they arose and, and to follow through when, when asked to, uh, to take on something and to volunteer when um, I saw something that might, I might be able to contribute to. So leadership style has been collaborative, observant and uh, founded in data. Thank you. Um, that's a different perspective, and I, that was really interesting. And then finally, Ms. Butler, last but not least. Thank you so much. Um, I, I love being on these kinds of panels because I always have things that I that I pick up and you know can write down in little tidbits. And so, thank you all for inviting me here. Um, I think that you know my leadership style has really evolved, and I'm much more aware of that evolution. Quite honestly, during the pandemic, because you had a lot of time to sit back and think, etc. 
Um, and this year I also will be turning 50. And so looking back on my life and you know where, where I've been and where I wanna go, um, I can say that you know when my 20s and 30s, really my leadership style in my mind was that I had to be in charge. Um, and you know, if, if other people weren't doing the job right, then they needed to get out of the way so I could get in to do it. Now, I would say that it's not really what I would want as a leader myself. Um, and that I think that one of the great traits about leaders that I've noticed is that you're always learning. You know, you're open mind, you're open minded. You recognize that you may not be the smartest person in the room, but you can find those people who are. And that there are things that you should strive for as a leader. And the things that I strive for as a leader are accountability, um, owning it when I make a mistake, um, recognizing others when they do things right, um, authenticity. This is something that's taken me a long time to get to with being my true self and being and not feeling that as a woman and particularly as a woman of color that I had to downplay any components of who I am or who, what my personality really is. And then also transparency, right? And so those are just three things that come to mind when I think about this question. And, you know, and I also love what, um, what Gina was saying about, you know, lifting those around you, because I have also taken note of the fact that sometimes I may be the only woman sitting around the table, but then there's other women that are maybe backbenchers at different meetings, particularly in the government. This is a big word we have to say, right, backbenchers. Um, but those folks have a lot to add to the conversation. And so instead of allowing those women to stay at the back of the bench, then what I actually take ownership of is inviting them to the table. So if you're the only one, recognize that that's not the way it should be and look for those others around you that you can bring along. And lastly, I just wanna share this poem that I actually came across recently by Rupi Kaur. It's really short. Um, it's, I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me thinking, what can I do to make this mountain taller so the women after me can see further? And it's just, I just love that poem because okay. it really does kind of sum up so much of what we should all be aspiring to. Oh my gosh. Amen. I, I love that poet. So I'm so glad that we can share that. That's so interesting. Um, but with that being said, you made a good point about um, kind of being an advocate. So what tools or skills um, or just general advice do you all have for young women who are beginning their careers and may need advocates. And then this is also a panel for the, or rather a question for the entire entire panel, but Ms. Butler, would you like to start us off then? Oh, sure. Um, I think that, you know, finding someone who can be an ally and that person doesn't have to be someone who looks like you. Um, I remember when I first got out of grad school, I was at this reception in DC and I met this person who I just thought was doing the coolest things and that I really wanted to do what they were doing. And it was a white gay man, right? So very far from what I am. But I really, I walked up to him and I was like, you and I are gonna be friends. Um, and to this day, he is one of my best friends and he has really been a career guru for me. So finding those people and, you know, and owning up to them and like, and you know, clasping onto them. I can't tell you how many people I give my email address out to and encourage to get in touch with me and don't follow up. And then, you know, a year or so later, they're like, oh yeah, I didn't know if I should, et cetera. Yes, you should have. If I offered it, you should have. So take advantage of those opportunities. And one thing that I know that women do that men don't do is that we also discount our experiences, right? So we will look at a job and we'll say, oh, I don't, I only meet three of the five criteria, so I'm not going to apply. You know what? That guy sitting right next to you, he probably meets none of those criteria, but he's going to apply for the job <laughs> and likely will get it because you didn't apply. So take advantage of the opportunities that come to you. And so that's my advice. That was great. That inspired me. I'm going to be, um, obviously graduating soon. So that gave me some advice. Miss um, um, Leemacher, would you like to chime in on this question? Uh, sure. Um, I, th I think that if you take um, a, uh, um, a number of, of approaches. Um, 
early on, I think, and I think you're doing this even in, in your, in, even as a student, you observe, you, you find out what works, what doesn't work, think about how you might do it better, you know, as you're kind of processing and developing the, this experience. Um, then then in, speak up as, uh, uh, as our previous speaker also mentioned, you know, when, when you have something uh, to, to say, you follow, you, um, you bring it up either after the meeting, either during the meeting, uh, during the encounter, uh, whenever you, you make sure that uh, the ideas that you have are, are, are shared. Um, people don't know what you know or don't know what you have to offer until you speak up. Um, and then to develop yourself, there's an awful lot of information. So it's not just observe, observing your, your limited world, which is by definition limited, um, but read, read and gain experiences. Um, uh, seek out opportunities as uh, Ms. Duncan did to you know, get involved with what, what uh, uh, you, you want to do, with, with what inspires you, with what your passion is. So the, these are some of the things that I think all of us will um, have done at some point or other. Thank you. Ms. Duncan, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, thank you. I think over my career, I really learned how to evolve from a manager to a leader. And that's such a critical nuance in, in your personal development, I think. And it really comes from learning how to really listen to your people around you that are so important. Understand their concerns, understand their body language. I remember at Wells Fargo as regional manager, I would go to my different branches across the state and when I walked into a particular branch, I could actually feel the tenor of that office. I could feel the energy in the, that office. Some offices, people were you know, quick to their step and things were going on and they were busy and they were happy. And other offices, you could just hear the silence of unhappiness. And so learning how to listen, not only to what your people are saying, but also to what they're feeling and what vibes that they're putting off. And then secondly, continuing to educate, you know, refine your craft. You know, there's a lot to leading in reference to communication skills and advocacy skills and, and passing off duties. Um, there's all kinds of skills that really takes learning, practicing and developing your craft. Then finally, finding your voice. And I think this also is something that takes practice and takes time. And it's different, your voice is different when you lead than it is, for example, now when I'm advocating, when I'm educating a group about transgender social justice, you know, I'm trying to move hearts and minds, right? Whereas a corporate senior manager, I was leading through goals and procedures and process and things like that. So it's important to find your voice in that space where you are and ensure that you're connecting to your team in a voice they understand and in a voice that inspires them. Thank you. And then finally, um, Ms. Irizarry, would you like to add? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think first and foremost, I think it's really important to get involved and to get involved either in your community, in your college, and find something that you have a passion about. And then find a board, find an organization, find a place that um, you can truly follow your passion because there you're going to develop great leadership skills. Being on a board helps you tremendously. Um, and then carrying that knowledge uh, into, into your uh, careers. And um, secondly, I think the most important thing, and I think we're gonna talk about that a little later, but it's so important to find a mentor early on. Um, while you are in college, finding that person that believes in you, that you can go to, that you can check in with per periodically. It doesn't have to be all the time. And I think the biggest step to finding a mentor is that oftentimes we're 
a little bit afraid to take the leap and ask someone if they will mentor you because we think they don't have the time or they have this big position. You're afraid to sort of, but don't be afraid to take the leap. You know, as a judge, I, I, I had to seek out a mentor myself. And uh, the way I went about doing that is by observing my fellow uh, women uh, judges and looking at the characteristics and the things about them that I admired. And so one day uh, there was this, this great judge. She's now the chief judge of the second DCH, Nelly Kozam. I, I just, I called her and I said, Judge Kozam, you know, um, would you be my mentor? And she was just thrilled, delighted. That I was so scared to make that call, but I made the call and she has become my mentor and still is my mentor till this day. And um, she was the one who swore me in when I became a judge at my investiture. And so it's so important to find that person that you can lean on because there's going to be ups and downs as you go. And sometimes you're going to feel like, I, I, I'm, you know, I just can't do that. You have to have somebody there that says, yes, you can. And, and this is what you need to do to, to get to your next step. And so getting out of your comfort zone and, um, and, and taking that, um, that leap of faith and uh, making many, many acquaintances. Um, you can have a few good friends, but like many acquaintances, especially acquaintances that are in your, um, in your profession that you will be going into. Uh, it's because uh, networking is, is super important. And so when you finally get to um, your chosen profession, joining the professional associations, like I, I am involved in every single bar association in the Sixth Judicial Circuit. So finding those associations that are pertinent to your profession and networking with the folks that uh, share uh, that, that knowledge. So uh, those are some of the tidbits of advice I can give. That was excellent. You actually just read my mind because the next question for the whole panel was actually what roles have mentors and mentorship played in your career? Because last year, it was last year, I think, um, people loved mentors and spoke so highly of the role of mentorship. So um, Ms. Butler, would you like to kind of start with that question? Sure. Um, so I think I mentioned my buddy, Ryan. Um, before. And um, I think that one of the things that I've learned about mentors, so Brian, I call my career guru, right? So he's the person I go to when I need advice about where I should be looking at for my for the next job, et cetera. But there's other people that I go to for advice about like different management things. And, you know, if I'm having trouble dealing with a particular employee, or, you know, if this person and I, we just aren't vibing and I want to know, like, I want to get somebody else's opinion. And so this goes back to what Miriam was saying, you know, you have multiple people don't. So I, I see myself as having multiple mentors, right? And those people aren't necessarily all senior to me. Some of them are my colleagues, but there are people who will be honest with me and tell me when I, when I need to take a step back, because maybe the issue is me. Um, or maybe my approach could be different, or maybe I'm not crazy and the situation is just really one that I can't control. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really, you have to have to be honest with yourself, right? About what you need, you know, do you need several people or do you just need one? And that situation may change and fluctuate. And so just be willing to go with the flow in, that, in those situations. Thank you. Ms. Duncan, do you have anything to add? I do. I think mentorship is so vital in someone's success. You know, a, a mentor can validate, can affirm, can really make you feel appreciated, and can certainly lift you up in reference to your confidence level and really take you to the next level. Um, at Equality Florida, I've been blessed in that our executive director, Nadine Smith, is an amazing mentor and communicator. And um, I've learned so much from working at Equality Florida over the last six years. Before that at Wells Fargo, I also had a wonderful mentor who had been in the business a long time and actually taught me the nuances of communication with employees. And that's really where my belief in being a servant leader developed 
and ensuring that everyone around me was succeeding so that we all could succeed. And I've carried that forward to today at Equality Florida. Every six months, we do a what we call our Transaction Leadership Academy. My program area is called Transaction. And what we do in different cities in Florida, we handpick a dozen young people between the ages of 18 and 25, and we educate them over a six month period. We mentor them in reference to public speaking, advocacy skills, messaging about important topics of the day. And when those dozen young people graduate, you know, that mentor experience that we've provided them and the skill sets that we hope we also have provided them, they're the next leaders. They're the next advocates who will pick up the baton, you know, when we, when we retire and we move on to other things. So I find those opportunities to mentor young people and really see them grow and develop into future leaders and know that I'm also passing the baton from those mentors who helped me so much along the way. Thank you. And then finally, um, Dr. Lemaker. Um, yes, so mentorship is, is very important. Um, as they've all said, and I, I just reiterate what, what has been said, but I also want to mention that sponsorship is important. And I think that sponsors have, have played a more of a role in my career development than mentors. Um, and the, the difference is that a sponsor may not have a mentorship relationship with you, but thinks enough of you or of your potential or recognizes that there may be a contribution you can make and will recommend you for a position, for a committee role, for a, another leadership role, for even a, a, an ad hoc task force, something that you can contribute and develop. So um, I've been recommended for uh, research opportunities, for leadership opportunities, for committee opportunities. And those have come from um, sponsors more than mentors. And I think that's another role that we also should take on uh, as we're trying to develop others in to take our places. That's so interesting. I'd never heard of that perspective before and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so since we're still um, kind of talking about leadership journey, we're now moving on to the more individual questions. I'm gonna be asking one panelist, but any other panelist is free to join whenever, just unmute. Um, so I actually wanted to just ask you, Dr. Lemaker, um, what did you consider to be a pivotal moment in your leadership journey and how did that impact or affect your journey? Uh, yeah, so, you know, yeah, a career in medicine is a lot of uh, putting your nose to the grindstone and getting through and reaching one goal and then another goal and then another and uh, at, at no stage in my training did I, I think I was going to become a leader in my profession. Um, it, it wasn't really until I decided to take an academic position um, and then at University of Florida which was my second academic position actually where I ended up staying the rest of my career I was uh, invited to participate in and an, another organization's um, training meeting, uh, a meeting for women in medicine. And it was at that meeting that I realized from the example of the other folks around me from other interactions that um, there could be another path, that it wouldn't have to be simply doing good clinical work or even having a research career, but, but taking a direction that could, could influence the other folks in the institution and around the country. So I think that pivotal moment was again, a sponsor recommending me for a, um, a slot in one of the uh, women in medicine programs of the uh, Association of Academic Medical Centers. So that was the, probably the, the one thing that I could say is a pivot then, then other, lots of other things happened after that. Thank you, would anybody else like to chime in on that? Um, well, I can chime in. <laughs> uh, I think that for me, a pivotal moment um, was when I became the first uh, Latina judge in the Sixth Judicial Circuit. And so, because I think it's, um, 
about shattering, right, these glass ceilings and opening doors for the women that come after us. And, um, you know, not being afraid um, to take that plunge, to reach that pivotal moment. And um, uh, one of the panelists was uh, speaking about uh, the need to build those relationships that are gonna give you recommendations and things like that. And so to become a judge, I mean, you really need the help and the support of a lot of people. A lot of lawyers have to write to the governor and they have to write to the judicial nominating commission. So it's a very difficult process to, to get uh, to become a judge. And so having establishing that and then utilizing those resources to reach those pivotal moments that help us to shatter these glass ceilings to open the door. And then once you are there uh, and you've opened that door, then our responsibility is to um, continue to leave that door open and to find ways um, by which we can get, I mean, it's there's no reason why I should be the only Latina judge in the Sixth Judicial Circuit. We have the biggest Hispanic population, you know, growing Hispanic population, and we should be representative of the communities that we serve. And so um, in, in order to, to continue to have that representation, we, when we get to these positions, have to find ways to open that door. And so for me, it was about, uh, I also teach as an adjunct instructor. And so I had students that would be coming through the paralegal program that I would invite them to my courtroom to sit and watch proceedings and then come back in chamber and discuss those things and use me as a resource. And so I think that those, those pivotal moments are moments of greatness, but they're also moments of responsibility. Thank you. Last call, would anybody else like to say any final comments? I'll jump in here just because I think that my career trajectory has been a little different because a career in international development was not something I ever imagined. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in Atlanta, you know, single mom, worked two jobs minimum most of my life when I was growing up. She put a lot of value in education, but when I graduated from undergrad, I really didn't know what I was gonna do. And it was really scary. Um, all I knew was that I kind of wanted to do something international and um, I wanted to, and I figured DC would be the best way for me to make that work. Um, I had a political science degree from Duke University, which at the time that really meant you were going to law school because I was really like the best alternative, right? To get a job that would pay for you to have that degree. <laughs> Um, and, but I didn't really want to be a lawyer. Um, and so I had an opportunity to, I started working at a PR firm, public relations firm, um, and they happened to have a contract with the World Bank. Um, and there was a slot that opened up on this, um, on the project that they were doing in Uganda around trying to educate broad, the broader population about uh, privatization. And, and quite honestly, I was the only black person that worked in the office at the time. And they came to me and they're like, would you be interested in going? I had no interest in Africa, never even thought about going there. When I was thinking internationally, I was thinking Europe, maybe Latin America, but never Africa. Um, and, um, but I said, okay. And I went and when I got, as soon as I got to Uganda, I was like, oh my God, I love this excuse me, <clears throat> this is the kind of work that I really want to do. And it was one of those things where it's like a light bulb went off. And so now I was like, all right, now I know what I want to do. I just have to figure out what else I need to do to keep doing it. And so that was really like the moment. I think that had I, I could have easily said, no, I don't want to go to this place that I've never heard of. I can't even find on a map. Um, but being open to those, those, those opportunities, regardless of how they come to you, Again, I knew that they only came to me because I was the only black person there um, and they really didn't have time to go and look for somebody else, but it turned out to be phenomenal for me. And that began, that set me on a path to where I am right now with the career that I feel is the one that I was meant to be doing. Yeah, and I would certainly like to add to that in that, um, 
I had a very interesting story that that relates to this in that in outing myself as a transgender woman, I've had this amazing journey of living half of my life as a guy and hopefully the next half of my life as a woman. And in doing so, working in the corporate banking world and knowing but not appreciating or realizing male privilege until I transitioned to Gina Duncan working at Wells Fargo, regional manager, overseeing 260 people, 26 branches. We would regularly have district meetings in Atlanta. And Greg, who I used to be, my region was always one of the top regions in the country. I had the number four region, usually three or four every year. And so when we would go to these district meetings, Greg's voice had clout. I would say something and sure, all the white guys, you know, oh yeah, great idea, we love that, yeah, yeah, you know, punch you on the shoulder, that kind of thing. My first district meeting as Gina, I had this amazing idea that I still remember to this day, it was a, it was a resolution to a really difficult structural problem within our whole regional system in underwriting and that kind of thing. And I brought up this idea expecting the usual, wow, that is a killer idea, crickets total crickets. And that moment, I really learned two things. Number one, there really is a glass ceiling. Number two, there really is in our corporate world, maybe a lot of work to be done in reference to including people that are diverse and certainly gender diverse in our business community. But I also learned another thing in that I thought about it overnight and couldn't sleep thinking about how the situation went down. So the next day when this meeting started, I teed up that very idea. And I stood up in front of the guys and I emphasized why this was such an important idea and really over, over explained it and over validated why it was a good idea. And finally, I got buy-in. But I realized this is everyday life for a lot of women in the workplace environment. They have to overdo, they have to oversell, they have to overachieve to be on the same playing field, a level playing field with men in the, in the workplace. So I learned a lot from that. And I learned to never um, let myself be male privileged again in the workplace. So it served me to this day. Thank you, I got goosebumps from that. That was, that was really, Powerful. Um, so, in in talking about these workplace situations, um, what is the best way to support other women? Then, Miss um, Butler, you shared that really great poem. If you could just kind of start the conversation. Sure. I think you know, like I said in the beginning, it's really looking around and seeing like where are the other women? Are they sitting at the table with you? Are they even in the meeting with you? Um, as as I, the other panelists have said, there's often lots of women in the workplace, but what voice do they have? And once you get to a position, once, sorry, my dog is getting a little needy. Um, once you get to a position where you can actually influence the, the presence of women in that area, um, then okay, move out of the way, sorry. Um, then you can, I think that it's your responsibility as a woman and as a leader to try to bring those other women with you and to ensure that maybe you were the one and only for a while, but that you won't continue to be the one and only, that there will be others behind you, that there are others with you when you're in that moment. And, you know, and it's small little things, you know, like I said, encouraging the women to speak up. If somebody interrupts them or is mansplaining what they said, or you know, even going to Gina's point, what I see happening a lot of times where people repeat, where a man will repeat something that a woman said as if it's his original idea. And everybody's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And you're like, wait, she just said that. Is calling that out, right? And, the, and I think it creates a space where other women feel more comfortable to be, to participate and to speak up. Um, and, you know, just owning that role for yourself as a leader. Thank you. If one more person would just like to chime in. 
or we can move on to the next question. That's totally great too. Um, so, um, Ms. Duncan, you've talked a lot about the fight for gender equality. Uh, what does that specifically look like in your career? Because you kind of go about different identities in a very inclusive way. You know, that's a really great question and certainly timely for what's happening in our country right now. Um, gender in our society today is so much more diverse than it, it's ever been. Um, in our gender spectrum, you know, we've, and it's very generational, right? That we've really moved from by gender identities to people who identify in a spectrum of gender identities. And in doing this work, it, there's a great deal of education around that that's, that's important to ensure that all identities are affirmed, safe, and included. For the longest time, and even in the last 10 years that I've been doing this work for Equality Florida, we spoke about gender identity in the binary of maleness and femaleness, man and woman, and those social constructs of, and one's gender identity, how you feel about yourself, your deeply held belief of who you are and how you relate with the world may or may not align with your assigned sex at birth. So the transgender discussion for the longest time was in the binary. And now because of, and this is certainly generational, our gender um, diversity has expanded to where people now also identify as non, was non-conforming and now is non-binary is the term. Which means that people don't believe in being pigeonholed into these two social constructs of maleness or femaleness. They identify as both, as neither, or in a very fluid state of, of identification and identifying with the world and their gender expression. So it's even more important, I think, that everyone have a seat at the table. You know, we started with saying our pronouns. That is, you know, a very subtle step for transgender and non-binary people to immediately know that they are affirmed and they're in a safe place because people understand that just by providing pronouns, you're ensuring that they won't be misgendered, that they're able to self-identify and they're able to interact with confidence with that group, feeling affirmed and validated. So I think that, you know, the more, we often have discussions with our young advocates of this concept of moving beyond gender, that someday gender will be seen as something that divides us more than brings us together. And that gender someday will be, you know, a passe construct of our grandfathers that no longer applies. We'll see, I don't know, but I think it's a really interesting concept. But in the meantime, the bottom line is everyone, no matter your gender identity or sexual orientation, everyone should be treated you know, with dignity and respect and validated in all spaces. Thank you. So it seems like this is probably gonna be our last question before we get the um, audience question and answer. So I just wanted to ask um, Ms. Irizari, I wanted to know how you reflect on leadership in order to grow and improve upon it. And if anybody would like to chime in, but please take it away. All right. Well, I uh, reflect on my leadership by uh, continuing to stay involved. You know, one of the things, and you guys are far from retirement, but, um, you know, when I made the decision to retire uh, in September, uh, the thought of not being in leadership positions and not being in the thick of things and kind of losing a little bit of yourself in that retirement. Um, and so for me, uh, I actually haven't had a moment of, of uh, not doing stuff because I am actively involved in uh, many, many boards. And, um, and so I think that um, staying active, staying involved, staying in the loop of the conversation, participating in forums like this, uh, it's important to continue to grow. I tune in to see uh, continuing legal education programs that I don't even need, but um, to stay on top of the conversation and to stay educated. You know, once you get through 
college and either grad school or law school or medical school, you know, you have continuing education that goes on, but above and beyond that continuing education is to continue to educate yourself about, uh, about your community, about um, ways of being able to help others because everything that you do, everything that you give uh, will be given back to you tenfold as far as your development um, as, as, as a woman into, into your uh, chosen profession. And so for me, it's, it's about continuing the journey, never letting the journey um, end, um, you know, writing a book about my family's journey. And it's a book about perseverance and overcoming obstacles and, and emerging from that little shack, uh, you know, to the judgeship and knowing that, that it's possible. And so I think uh, leaders um, have to have that continuing educational pattern and never forgetting like where you came from and never forgetting uh, the people that helped you along the way and the community that lifted you up and being able to. And so for me, it's, it's finding those opportunities where I can help other um, um, students, either economically disadvantaged students or women um, students that are in my, in my um, college programs. And, um, you know, I, th I think I mentioned earlier, my great mentee, Tina Bat, who was on the call, and my young nephew, um, uh, Jose, uh, who's also on the call. And these are young people that have great aspirational dreams. And so uh, part of my leadership is to, to help in their continuing development and to be here for them uh, as they continue to go into, into their professions. And, and for me also was providing opportunities where opportunities didn't exist, but for the fact that I was there as a judge. So uh, all of my judicial assistants that I hired during the time that I was a judge came from my student pool, uh, came from young uh, women and uh, particularly uh, who wanted to go to law school, who wanted to be a judge, but never knew a lawyer or a judge. And so to be given the opportunity of working right in the judicial system, hand in hand with all the judges and all the lawyers, it's finding those opportunities and, and um, providing those for the, uh, for the young people that come behind you. So uh, I, have a, I, I feel like I have a leadership responsibility, uh, a continuing leadership responsibility uh, that uh, will continue to evolve as, as I myself grow. Thank you. So we are moving on to the audience question and answer. And I just wanted to remind you all that you can private message questions to Sophia or Madison, but you can also raise your hand if you feel comfortable. Um, we already have some great questions that have been submitted. So I'm going to read one. Um, this one's for Dr. Lemaker. So it seems like you work in a male dominated field, although I would say the same for mostly, if not all of all of you, um, but when encountering discrimination in the workplace, how have you countered these microaggressions and or explicit discrimination? Well, that's a, uh, that's a really great question. Um, yes, uh, medicine, particularly academic medicine remains male dominated, cardiology remains male dominated. I will tell you that we're, we're seeing a, a bit of a uh, a revolution in that uh, medical school is now at least 50% women in training in, in the medical school. Um, trying to uh, uh, advocate for the kinds of um, fields that are still male dominated is kind of the role of those of us who are in those fields, I think. So we, I think we want to embrace the, the role of the role model for especially when we have a position where we encounter those in training who have not yet um, decided on their ultimate career goal. So, so that's, that's one thing uh, once we've reached that leadership role. Um, in terms of the, the microaggressions and the encountering discrimination, um, it, it, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, I'd like to say it's getting better, um, and I think it is. I mean, when I was uh, interviewing for medical school, I was asked, well, 
do you think you want to get married and have children and be a doctor? Um, you can't ask that anymore, thank God. Um, and I, I just sat there and said, well, of course, <laughs> I do think I can do all this. I did do it all. It's not easy, but there are lots of ways and lots of assistance um, by your, um, the, all of your mentors and your colleagues that, that will show you ways that will work for you, um, for anyone who is uh, contemplating this as a career. Um, but um, I, I think speaking up is the most important way to address the, these things, particularly when they occur, particularly in a group. We have a tradition of what's called rounding. You've seen this on the, the hospital shows um, where this group of doctors led by the senior doctor and all the, the interns and residents go from patient to patient and they discuss things. Well, you know, with, if the, a patient were to address the female student or a female resident and say, you know, well, I, I really expect to see a, a male, then whoever is the senior person there needs to speak up and say, we are all part of a team here. These are all outstanding people. We expect them to be part of your team as well. There, there are ways to talk about that. That is very important to speak up at the moment, um, sometimes also uh, privately afterward. I think uh, the folks who continue to make these, these um, observations uh, to voice these aggressions on us still don't realize that it's the perception of their actions and not the intent of their actions that is so important. I mean, the frequent excuse is, I didn't mean it that way. Well, I'm sorry, that's how it came across and you need to be aware of that. So, so there's a, it's an ongoing challenge. I think we're all uh, dealing with it in our own ways. Thank you. That was really alarming, the, the question that you shared. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but it was a long time. <laughs> thank goodness for that. But if anybody else would like to chime in on the microaggression question. Okay, we have another question. This is a really um, great one. So aside from calling out mansplaining, what other ways can men project their support for women in the workplace and in other aspects of life? So how can men join the effort at uplifting women in leadership? This one is a question aimed towards all the panelists. So if anybody would like to just take this one. You know, for me, and again, my perspective is a little bit skewed, but for me, it's, it's about normalcy in that in there should be a level playing field in all aspects of life. And especially at work in that, you know, from mansplaining to male privilege to glass ceilings, all of these things, they should be talked about, they should be educated on, they should be certainly called out when they happen. And along those lines, you know, the, these different categories that we get into in reference to, you know, microaggressions and discrimination and things like that are certainly things that should be called out whenever it, it does occur. But also these are situations that should bring us back to an understanding of, of social equality. Because it's, it's almost, you know, gender is also very complicated in that it intersects with many different things, especially in my world of LGBTQ advocacy and education. And it intersects, for example, with racial equity. You know, what does that look like in the workplace? And that how does that intersect with gender equality? The way or perhaps maybe black trans women in our advocacy movement are not getting the same safe spaces that we are as white transgender women. So even you know, in those various subsections of our society, it's all about ensuring normalcy and ensuring that everyone not only has a seat at the table, but also is speaking at that table. I guess I, I would add that, um, you know, there are some very wonderful men that are good leaders in the in all of the different things that I'm involved in 
And um, we need to support each other that way. And we need to surround ourselves with um, uh, people, men, women, people that have those good philosophies and those good hearts and compassionate hearts. Um, and when these microaggression types of situations or discrimination happen, we have to call it out. We have to be strong enough to call it out. And, um, you know, the legal profession is a male dominated profession. Um, the judicial system, uh, the bulk of the judges are, are male. And, um, you know, talking about um, being tested uh, as a minority woman, Latina woman, you know, you're tested. You have to be better. You have to do more. You have to work harder. And my first year on the bench, I was tested. I was tested by every one of those lawyers. And, you know, so you have to be strong to overcome that. And typically minority judges, um, uh, most judges that are not minority judges, they don't face a, a, a campaign challenge, but nine out of 10 minority judges face a campaign challenge. And so when I faced my challenge and I knew the sources from which that was coming, you know, um, I, you know, I had to step up to the plate and fight like hell to keep that job. And so I, my campaign manager was um, my, my good friend, Dan Perry. And, and Dan and I, we went to work hard <laughs> every step of the way to, and we won. And we won against a sitting um, legislative representative in Tallahassee who chose to run against me. So that was tough. That was a tough race. But the point is uh, the, the little things that started to happen my first year on the bench and microaggression and the lawyers challenging you were all little things moving toward removing me from the bench at the next election, you know? And so being able to, to surround yourself with people who believe in you, good men, good women who believe in you uh, is how you can remain strong um, to, to overcome some of these things. I'll jump in as well, because I think that, um, so international development, similar to diplomacy for those who aren't very familiar with it, is very white male dominated. Um, currently, USAID has about has a little over 10,000 employees, and we work in over 100 countries around the world. And only in one of those countries do we have a Black female who's the leadership, who is the head of the USAID mission there. So we still have a ways to go. Um, and I think that what we see now is that there's a growing recognition that there is a ways to go and that we need to begin to address it. But as far as like the role that men can play in helping it really is doing something that I think is, is challenging for all of us, which is recognizing that they have unconscious bias and that they display these biases in a variety of ways. And granted, we all have unconscious bias, right? Um, but how they display the, how we all display this and how we are aware of it is the best way that we can do um, to move forward and to move forward as a community, uh, particularly on the international development side when we're moving to a different country every two years on average. And so you'll have different cultures that you're having to deal with that are not ones that you're used to and you know dealing with the challenges that come from that. Um, and then you've got the culture that you're dealing with at work, uh, when you're working with Americans who bring those issues to work sometimes. Um, but like, like Miriam said, there are a lot of really great men out there who genuinely want to be helpful. But um, the thing I always tell them is that I don't need a savior. What I need is an ally. And, and so you have to sometimes check them. Like, I don't want you to come in and, and save me. I want you to just be there when the situation calls for me, having someone to back me up. And so those, that's just my thoughts on that. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so we have a raised hand. Lynn, would you like to pose your question? You can unmute. 
Yes, I would. Um, thank y'all so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate every single one of you. Oh, start my video. Yes. Um, hi. Um, I'm a fourth year political science major here at UF and I graduate in May and I'm super excited, but because I'm actually um, pre-law and I'm going to be going to law school after I take a gap year. But during this gap year, I really wanted to focus on being involved with the community and setting roots in our in not only Gainesville, but in Florida, so that we can strengthen community involvement and overall community structure. So I was wondering if y'all have any favorite organizations or tips or ways to be involved and things to do to strengthen community ties um, anywhere in, across the state of Florida, really. Oh goodness, let me jump on that. <laughs> um, Equality Florida, as you know, is a statewide LGBTQ advocacy organization. We have like 300,000 members across the state. And we have a number of different programs and we are always looking for people to get involved from our field department to our public policy, safe and healthy schools, transaction, um, development, communications, et cetera. And our goal is quite frankly, to ensure social equality in the state of Florida for everyone, no matter your sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. So Equality Florida is, I think, a fertile ground to learn so much. So many of our senior people in the various departments joined us as interns and just seeing them grow and learn and become more and more confident in their communication skills and advocacy skills um, is really something that I love to see and that we really foster within the organization. So to get involved in everything from what's happening in Tallahassee with public policy and legislation, everything from hate crimes to anti-transgender sports bills, which are going on right now, uh, it's a great place to get involved and really make a difference. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And I'm definitely going to check that out because I, I really do want to contribute to my community. And I am part of the Women's Student Association. And so I tried to make sure that my activ activism is really intersectional and that I'm giving attention and um, putting in the effort into being really intentional with my activism and with my intersectionality. Thank you so much, that is so important. Uh, can I um, can I just quick quick response also uh, uh, another area um, in the courts that are in great need of uh, volunteers is the guardian at Leiden program and um, so most of the circuits throughout the state of Florida have a guardian at Leiden office um, that you can volunteer at and um, once you become a, a um, guardian you would uh, represent the interests of the children in the court system and uh, assist uh, in the program. And so if you know the legal profession is where you wanna go, there is a, a lot of judicial involvement and court contact uh, by way of the Guardian Met Leiden program. But of course the uh, programs that Gina was referring to are also a wonderful initiative. So, there's a lot of great opportunity to develop yourself during that gap year. Thank you so much. I really appreciate hearing from both of you. Thank you. Well, so this is gonna be our last question of the evening. Um, it's pretty apropos based off of the setting. So what is one piece of advice that you would give your college self in your journey to leadership? And anybody can take this. I'll, I'll start. Um, I would just say, um, don't be afraid to fail. Go, go at what you're interested in. Um, seek advice, seek other training, develop competency. Before you can be a leader, you must be recognized for your competence. Um, and, uh, and don't be afraid if something doesn't work out to take on something else. Thank you. Um, Ms. Butler, I know that you had an interesting journey. Would you like to add to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, it's like, you know, my college self, I probably should have spent more time in the library and less time at the frat parties. Um, but, you know, beyond that, one thing I definitely think I didn't do when I was in college is that I didn't develop those, I didn't seek out those mentor relationships where we talked about earlier at the college level, because there was a lot of resources that were available at my school. But because I really didn't, you know, again, I'm a first generation college attendee. So I really didn't have anybody telling me who I should be going to or what I should be doing. I was kind of just like finding my own way. And I really wish that I had, you know, some of those relationships. There was one professor that, you know, I, that really kind of took me under his wing, but he left before I graduated and w went to another school and I lost touch with him. But I never really bothered to try to form that relationship with another teacher or professor at the time. And I really wish I had. And so I know that University of Florida, you've got fantastic faculty members and fantastic staff that your student body should really be encouraged to reach out to and hold on to those people and you know, form those relationships that will take you, you know, throughout the rest of your career. And going back to what Dr. Leemacher said, those people can become your sponsors, um, you know, which I didn't have and I, I wish I had done that. Thank you. Um, and then would you like to chime in, um, Ms. Irizarry? Um, I think, um, all right, knowing, uh, knowing a lot of young college students now, the difference between the students I know now and the student that I was in college, I really wish I was more like the students I know now. The students I know now are so focused. My two mentees, I would never even think about the kinds of things that they are thinking about right now. I would not have done half of the things that they have accomplished because I was having a lot of fun in college. They were really fun years. And while I was in college, I was active in the community and I was, um, uh, political science was, was you know, my major and Puerto Rican studies, so I had a dual major. And I, I loved what I was majoring in but I didn't have that focus that young students have today. So my, my only word of advice though, is to still have a little fun while you are doing this. Don't forget to have that. And if you are a person of faith, uh, lean on your faith and know that uh, God is going to um, walk you through this journey and, uh, and that, um, you know, that things, that things are going to be okay. So I guess my word of advice is continue to be as focused as you are, but just remember to have a little fun along, along the way and uh, to, to find things that uh, really make you happy. Thank you. And then Ms. Duncan, would you like to close that off? Yeah, so well said. I would say that it's important to do the work. You know, you have to do the work. And that involves all aspects of doing the work of educating yourself and being a good listener and knowing the topics and knowing the subject, but never fail to listen to your inner voice. You know, sometimes in the past, I found myself either not listening to that inner voice or overthinking things. And nine times out of 10, that was the wrong decision. You know, the old saying of follow your gut. You know, listen to that inner voice. I don't think I've ever heard anything more true than that simple statement that in the clutch, when things are really tight or things are very important, follow your instincts, follow your heart, listen to that inner voice in making those very tough decisions. Thank you. I can think of a better way to close that off. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you all so, so, so much. Thank you for everybody who attended. And thank you again to Joan Forrest for her support of the event and for developing women leaders at UF. And of course, a big, huge thanks to the panelists for leading as exemplary women and exemplary role models. We are so, so grateful to have heard your stories and your advice. And I know that as, an, as a very close graduate, um, I needed this very, very badly. So I would just like to thank you all so much. And then before we head out, I just like to make a few announcements um, from the Graham Center. 
we will be um, having <clears throat> Lillian before you do that uh, this yeah. is Joan Forrest um, there was so much discussion about um, mentoring I just wanted to mention that there is a formal mentoring program in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences as part of the Beyond 120 program. So I just wanted to encourage everyone on the call, if you have not heard about that, to look into it. Um, I'm one of the mentors. There's a platform that matches mentors with mentees. And um, we couldn't agree uh, more strongly that uh, mentorship is extremely important. In addition to being associated with the Graham Center, I chair the Dean's Leadership Council for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And uh, there's a number of us um, that are on that, uh, that are working really diligently to expand that mentorship program. So please, all of you on the call, look into that. And um, uh, let's see, uh, Marianne just put a link in the chat box uh, where you can find information about Beyond 120. So sorry to interrupt, but thank you very much. No, thank you. That was so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so like I said, thank you all so much for coming. There are two events coming up soon um, with the Graham Center, if you all will see the screen. The first one is on April 1st called Climate Change and Community Resilience. It's about sustainability. And the other one is Children Under Fire on April 8th. Um, they're both going to be really great. So thank you all again for coming. I really appreciate it. We from the fellows and the center really appreciate it. And I hope you all have a, a great rest of your night. Thank you. And make sure to stay in touch through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the Bob Graham Center. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Happy night.